So science fiction is defined as a means of understanding the world through speculation and storytelling. Science fiction has a history that goes back to an era when the dividing line separating the mythological from the historical tends to become somewhat blurred. And the question is, did science fiction actually guide our understanding, our concept of outer space and the so-called universe? Did science fiction lead to confirmation bias in so-called real science? Did science fiction lead to social engineering in favor of a fictional universe? In this video, I would like to briefly summarize works of science fiction that date back to the early 1600s. Yes, the early 1600s. Now, science fiction exploded in the 1900s when there was an insane amount of novels, short stories, comics, movies, radio broadcasts, all describing fantastic space travel and the universe. In this video, I would like to simply focus on science fiction prior to the 1900s. And again, the question to keep in mind is, did science fiction brand outer space? Is our understanding of the universe based on real facts, investigations, and observations? Or is it simply programmed from science fiction? So, first up, we have The Man in the Moon, a book by the English Divine and Church of England Bishop, Mr. Francis Godwin, and it is generally thought to have been written in the late 1620s and published in 1638. The work is notable for its role in what was called the New Astronomy, the branch of astronomy influenced especially by Nicolaus Copernicus. And although Copernicus is the only astronomer mentioned by name, the book also draws on the theories of Kepler and Gilbert. So it's interesting right there that the first, one of the first science fiction novels was written by someone high up in the Church of England, and it also pushed the um, branch of science called New Astronomy by Copernicus, Kepler, and others. So right away it's interesting. So in this story, he uses his flying machine powered by birds to fly higher and higher toward the moon, which they reach after a journey of 12 days. There, Gonzales encounters the Lunars, a tall Christian people inhabiting what appears to be a utopian paradise. And after six months of living among them, Gonzales becomes homesick and concerned for the condition of his birds, so he sets off to return to Earth. And shortly after that, we have uh, Johann Kepler's book called Somnium. This was written in 1634. Now, Somnium presents a detailed imaginative description of how the Earth might look when viewed from the moon, and it is considered the first serious scientific treatise on lunar astronomy. So again, that's interesting. It's a work of fiction, but it's considered the first serious scientific treatise on lunar astronomy. Wow. Now, the story begins with a dream by Kepler in which he is reading a book about Duracatus, an Icelandic boy who is 14 years old. The boy and his mother are both familiar with astronomy, although his mother learned what she knows from demons. And the book describes demons helping humans travel around the world and even to the moon in great detail as well. It talks about how demons are overpowered by the sun and that they dwell in the shadows of the earth. And the demons can rush to earth during a solar eclipse, otherwise they remain hidden in shadows. And the book describes scientific details such as how eclipses would look from the moon, uh, the size of the planets varying in size due to the moon's distance from the earth, and an idea about the size of the moon and other details of the celestial bodies. And then eventually Kepler wakes up from the dream because of a storm outside and he realizes that his head is covered and he is wrapped in blankets just like the characters in his story. So. Very interesting work of fiction. 
Next up, we have Margaret Cavendish's The Blazing World, written in 1666. Blazing World is a fanciful depiction of a satirical utopian kingdom in another world with different stars in the sky that can be reached via the North Pole. It is the only known work of utopian fiction by a woman in the 17th century. And then after that, or actually it was written a few years before, but we have um, the science fiction works by Serrano de Bergerac, and these are the comical history of the states and empires of the moon and the states and empires of the sun. Arthur C. Clarke credited this book with being the first example of a rocket-powered space flight and for inventing the ramjet. <laughs> I don't know how it invented the ramjet, but this novel from, or these three stories from the mid-1600s, according to Arthur C. Clarke, were responsible th for um, describing rocket-powered spaceflight and inventing the ramjet. So, anyways, in part one, an attempt to reach the moon to prove there is a civilization that views Earth as its moon leads the narrator to soar from Paris into the sky by strapping bottles of dew to his person, but he fails and lands back on Earth. Believing to have traveled straight up and down, he is confused by local soldiers who tell him he is in France. They escort him to the provincial governor who informs him that it is, in fact, New France. The narrator explains to the governor that all matter is formed inside and expelled from stars, and that once the sun has run out of fuel, it will consume the planets and restart the cycle. Uh, the narrator tries again to construct a way of reaching the moon, this time through a flying machine that he launches off a cliff's edge. Though the craft crashes, local soldiers attach rockets to it, hoping that it will fly to celebrate the feast day of St. John the Baptist. Now, dismayed at this use of his machine, the narrator attempts to deconstruct it while the fuse is lit, but the machine takes off and sends him into space. He meets inhabitants who have four legs, musical voices, and amazing weapons that cook game for a meal while it's being shot. Wow, that's interesting. As well as the ghost of Socrates and Domingo Gonzalez of Francis Godwin's The Man in the Moon. Let's see how they connect these fictional stories together. Um, his discussions with Gonzalez include how useless of a concept God is, that humans cannot achieve immortality, and that they do not have souls. After these discussions, the narrator returns to Earth. In part two, a new machine that focuses solar energy through mirrors to generate bursts of air sends the narrator to the sun. Those living on a sunspot teach him about the solar system by relating it to how atoms move. Upon the surface of the sun, he is tried for all the crimes humanity has committed by birds, but one who knows him sets him free. The narrator then discusses with Tommaso Campanella how sex would work in Utopia. So, well, that's kind of a whacked out story there, but there it is, uh, 1600s. Moving along, we have Voltaire's Micromegas, and Micromegas is a 1752 short story. And the tale recounts the visit to Earth of a being from a planet circling the star Sirius and of his companion from the planet Saturn. In the story, Micromegas gets banished and takes this as an incentive to travel around the universe in a quest to develop his intellect and his spirit. And eventually they arrive on Earth and circumnavigate it in 36 hours. And the final chapter sees the humans testing the philosophies of Aristotle, Descartes, Malebranche, Leibniz, and Locke against the traveler's wisdom. When the travelers hear the theory of Aquinas that the universe was made uniquely for mankind, they fall into an enormous fit of laughter. Taking pity on the humans, the Syrian decides to write them a book that will explain the point of everything to them. 
When the volume is presented to the Academy of Science in Paris, the secretary opens the book only to find blank pages. <laughs> so next up we have our favorite propagandist author, Mr. Jules Verne. And he wrote From the Earth to the Moon in 1865. And it tells the story of the Baltimore Gun Club, a post-American Civil War society of weapons enthusiasts, and their attempts to build an enormous Columbiad space gun and launch three people and a projectile with the goal of a moon landing. A giant Columbiad space gun is constructed in Tampa, Florida, after the American Civil War with the purpose of striking the moon. And the story is also notable in that Verne attempted to do some rough calculations as to the requirements for the cannon and considering the comparative lack of any data on the subject at the time, some of his figures are surprisingly close to reality. So there we go. This science fiction is close to reality. The dimensions of his projectile are very close to those of Apollo 11, and both the crews in his story and in Apollo 11 consisted of three people. Um, Jules Verne's Columbiad, from which the command module Columbia was named, launched the three heroes at a site in Tampa, Florida, the same state where the Apollo missions were launched. After considering 12 sites in Texas and Florida, the southern city of Tampa was Verne's choice for his launch site, and more than 100 years later, it was NASA's turn to choose from seven launch sites, arriving at the decision to launch at Merritt Island, Florida, a two-hour ride from Tampa. Also, Verne's fictional spacecraft introduced the concept of retro rockets, an engine designed to decelerate a speeding rocket. And then more than a century later, Apollo 11 would actually employ these retro rockets to allow them to slow down before landing on the lunar surface. How convenient. Okay, so another novel by Jules Verne was Off on a Comet. This was an 1877 novel, and this story starts with a comet called Galia that touches the Earth in its flight and collects a few small chunks off it. The disaster occurred on January 1st in the late 1800s around Gibraltar. And on the territory that was carried away by the comet, there were a total of 36 people of French, English, Spanish, and Russian nationality. And these people did not realize at first what had happened and they considered the collision to be an earthquake. They were all on the comet, which was discovered by Rosette, who a year earlier predicted a collision course with Earth, but no one believed the astronomer because a layer of thick fog at the time prevented astronomi astronomical observations in other places. And then after that we have a novel titled The Conquest of the Moon, it was a French novel written in 1887 by Pachal Grousset under the pseudonym André Lory. This is known as perhaps one of the most fanciful cosmic tales of all times. In it, a consortium which intends to exploit the moon's mineral resources... Now where did I just hear that? Oh yeah, Moon Express, the company, says they're going to mine the moon and exploit the minerals on the moon. So this is obviously not a new concept. It was written about in 1887. So the consortium, which intends to exploit the moon's mineral resources, decides that since our satellite is too far to be reached, it must be brought closer to the Earth. And a Sudanese mountain composed of pure iron ore becomes the headquarters of the newly established Saline Company. Solar reflectors are used to provide the energy required to convert the mountain into a huge electromagnet with miles of cables wrapped around it. A spaceship observatory is then built on the top of the mountain. And when the experiment begins, the mountain is ripped away from the Earth and catapulted to the moon. There, the protagonists have various adventures and eventually return to Earth by re-energizing the mountain. Oh, that story sounds pretty good. 
And then after that we have 1883, A Voyage to Other Worlds by um, Somerville. I can't even pronounce his first name, Vladislaw, Vladislaw Somerville. Now this is a Victorian novel which was previously thought to be the first published work to apply the word Martian as a noun. After the protagonist, Illyrial, lands on Mars, he buries his spacecraft in snow so that it might not be disturbed by any Martian who might come across it. The book details the creation and use of apergy, a form of anti-gravitational energy, and details a flight to Mars in 1830. So this book, published in 1883, details anti-gravity spaceflight to Mars. And in addition to that, we have Edison's Conquest of Mars, a 1898 science fiction novel by American astronomer and science fiction writer Garrett Service. I wonder if it's a requirement to be an astronomer. You also have to invent science fiction. So, um... In this novel, the Martians are more humanoid with arms, legs, and an enormous head with projector-like eyes. The residents of Ceres are at war with the Martians. When Edison's men land on the moon, they discover that the moon was, at one point, capable of supporting life. Only a giant footprint is seen, leaving the reader and the characters wondering what was once there. Hmm. And then after that we have Journey to Mars, the Wonderful World, its beauty and splendor, its mighty races and kingdoms, its final doom. A uh, science fiction novel written in 1894 by Gustavus Pope. Uh, Lieutenant Frederick Hamilton, U.S. Navy, on a voyage to Antarctica, um, has his ship wrecked, and he and Maori... Um, a sailor, are cast onto a barren island. Though near the end of his endurance, Hamilton rescues a strange-looking man before he loses consciousness. He awakens three weeks later aboard a spaceship traveling to Mars. So that's a nice, fantastic story there in 1894. And after that, we have Journey to Venus, the primeval world, its wonderful creations and gigantic monsters. This is an 1895 science fiction novel written by Gustavus Pope, and in the novel they travel to Venus on a Martian Aethervolt spacecraft. Modern critics have noted the book largely for its depiction of giant dinosaur-like beasts, and Pope's pair of novels on Mars and Venus were precursors of popular planetary adventure novels of the 20th century by Edgar Rice Burroughs and other writers. So they just keep building upon each other's scientific works. Uh, next we have A Journey in Other Worlds, A Romantic of the Future, a science fiction novel by John Jacob Astor IV, published in 1894. The book offers a fictional account of life in the year 2000. It contains abundant speculation about air travel, space travel to the planets Saturn and Jupiter, and terraforming, damming the Arctic Ocean, and adjusting the Earth's axial tilt by the Terrestrial Axis Straightening Company. In Astor's novel, the future United States is a multi-continental superpower. European nations have been taken over by the socialist governments, and Canada, Mexico, and the countries of South America have requested annexation. Space travel is achieved through apergy, an anti-gravitational energy force. Jupiter proves to be a jungle world with flesh-eating plants, vampire bats, giant snakes, and mastodons, and flying lizards. The Americans discover a wealth of exploitable resources, Iron, silver, gold, lead, copper, coal, and oil. Saturn, in contrast, is an ancient world of silent spirits. The spirit beings provide the explorers with foresight of their own deaths. Out beyond Neptune, the voyagers discover the icy world of Cassandra, 
home to the souls of unworthy earthlings. <laughs> and then after that we have Omega, the last days of the world. And it is a science fiction novel published in 1894 by Camille uh, Flammarion, or Camille Flammarion. Camille Flammarion is a French astronomer, again, um, from the 1800s mainly, who called the study of the heavens the science which concerns us most. His compelling and highly illustrated introduction to astronomy had sold over 100,000 French copies before this English translation appeared in 1894. So that's amazing. This French astronomer, who again is also a science fiction writer, had a very detailed and illustrated book selling over 100,000 copies in French before the English translation even appeared. So right there, they're starting to put pictures in your mind about space and space travel. Um, Camille Flammarion was the brother of Ernest Flammarion, founder of the group Flammarion Publishing House. And this image that we all know is the Flammarion engraving, which first appeared in 1888, the 1888 edition of L'Atmosphere. Um, in 1907, he wrote that he believed that dwellers on Mars had tried to communicate with the Earth in the past. Well, this guy's just crazy. <laughs> But he's an astronomer, and we believe everything that he says. He also believed in 1907 that a seven-tailed comet was heading toward Earth. In 1910, for the appearance of Halley's Comet, he believed the gas from the comet's tail would impregnate the Earth's atmosphere and possibly snuff out all life on the planet. Whoa, this guy is out there like Pluto. Um, as a young man, Flammarion was exposed to two significant social movements in the Western world. The thoughts and ideas of Darwin and Lamarck, and the rising popularity of Spiritism, with spiritualist churches and organizations appearing all over Europe. He has been described as an astronomer, mystic, and storyteller who was obsessed by life after death and on other worlds, and who seem to see no distinction between the two. So these guys are crazy religious fundamentalists. These science fiction writers, these astronomers, they are total cult fundamentalists in, in my opinion. So next up we have To Venus in Five Seconds, an account of the strange disappearance of Thomas Plummer Pillmaker, which is a science fiction satire written by Fred Jane. Published in 1897, the novel pokes fun at several of the main subgenres of speculative fiction that had become popular in the final years of the 19th century. So I really need to read this uh, novel since it's making fun of all the other science fiction novels. So that's interesting, and I'm definitely going to have to read that one. Um, after that, we have Two Planets, a German novel written by... Um, science fiction author Kurd Laswitz and it is about a group of Arctic explorers who were seeking the North Pole when they find a Martian base there. The Martians can only operate in a polar region not because of climatic requirements but because their spacecraft cannot withstand the rotation of the Earth at other latitudes. <laughs> so that, oh, that's cool. At least the book allows you to understand that the Earth is spinning and at the equator it's going you know over a thousand miles per hour and then obviously not very not as fast at the poles and then finally because I know this video is getting long and boring we have the War of the Worlds by H.G. Um, Wells 1898 which describes an invasion of late Victorian England by Martians using tripod fighting machines equipped with advanced weaponry. It is a seminal depiction of an alien invasion of Earth. So there you have it, a little introduction into the world of science fiction prior to the 1900s.